thank you so much for that introduction, Shell, and I'm so grateful to be here and share this project with you, which is a collaborative project with my colleague Nassim Parvin, who's an associate professor in digital media at the Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. And she couldn't come travel, but she's here. She's on the Zoom webinar and she's in the Discord and excited to discuss with everyone there as well. But I'll present, I'll present uh, on, on behalf of both of us now. So in this talk, we share feminist philosophical toys which is an in-progress project that consists of a series of DIY paper toys as an alternative to gamification for teaching core concepts in feminist philosophy. And the role play in our project is focused on a deeper understanding of the role of the self in all of its entangled intersectionality, as opposed to taking on the role of, of another or a fictional positioning. Um, and, oh, sorry, I'm sort of juggling computers. So the, the, the feminist philosophical toys, before I get into each one, to say they're a set of paper machines for thinking with. They're grounded in an understanding of the rhetorical and educational powers of materiality. And this project provides an approach to feminist theory, design, and critique through the use of cut and fold paper objects in which toys, as opposed to a game's rules, act as the companions of play. The toys challenge the dominant form of theorizing and the mechanics of knowledge making, the academic text, and have been piloted both in the US and in Sweden with a range of ages from high school through college, also adult learners, and in disciplines including HCI, game design, art, and education. So we push against the ubiquity of text uh, in philosophy, but also academia at large, and also against the high economic and environmental costs of digital technology with the playful and humble paper toy. Through a process of co-constituted becoming, this toy is feminist philosophy. The toys aren't just about feminist philosophy, they are actually. They unfold a space for the possibility of liberation together in community. So before I show you each toy, just to say each toy has a handout that goes with it, which includes a discussion of the toy to be made, some practical instructions, citations to the relevant scholarship, and then prompts to consider both for the process of making the toy and for dialogue. And each toy is presented with a ghost figure, a feminist figure or group from the past whose history is relevant to the topic, but who may have been overlooked or misunderstood or underrepresented or even erased from dominant histories. So in the limited time I have here though, I'm basically just gonna share images of the toys and focus more on the concepts that they make more accessible and open for dialogue. So the first toy is bookmaking. And so we begin with a handmade book with a stone binding and participants are introduced to the basics of bookmaking which provides them with a surface for keeping notes, sketches, uh, materials used in developing the subsequent toys. The simplicity of this first activity is an invitation into making. At the same time, participants with more experience can make more complex versions if they wish. And the toy brings to the fore issues of knowledge production and showcases the rhetorical power of form and material mattering. Once ideas are in a book, they are culturally present in a way that has a particular valence. And this is an invitation for conversation about knowledge making in different cultures and contexts, communities, academia too, of course. And for toy number one, the ghost figures are the women who sewed concealed pockets to carry all kinds of objects in the 17th and 18th century, including books and the books that were specifically designed for this purpose, which gives us the term pocketbook, which is still in use today. And here's a couple of examples, varying complexity. And the second toy is Oracle cards. So I was super excited to see the tarot card research uh, project from earlier today. This definitely connects. So Oracle cards are a critical and satirical play on the proliferation of design cards that are commonly used in design education and industry today. So this toy is offered to aid the designer who lacks foresight, who can benefit from the use of divination uh, in, similar to Tara or other Oracle decks. And the cards are to help conceptualize potential failures, both disastrous and pedestrian uh, of our own making and our own designs. And so this toy works to materialize feminist theories that might be considered common sense, but are often ignored or underplayed in dominant discourses of technology development. And examples include the need to consider long-term impacts of technology or the work that the rhetoric of the unintended consequence does to absolve designers of responsibility. And the ghost figure for the toy is Pamela Coleman Smith, the artist of the Rider Waite Smith 
tarot deck in common use today. And unfortunately, the deck is often called the Rider Weight deck, a naming convention that erases her contribution. And she was a prol prolific creative. She worked across publishing, illustration, writing, art, and design from the 1880s to the 1950s, also on the design of activist posters in support of women's suffrage. And there are some examples, different approaches to the Oracle cards. And the third toy is experience frames. So experience frames work to explore the concept of positionality, um, both in knowledge-making practices and in broader experiences of both impression, oppression and empowerment. So the toy takes inspiration from 19th century movable books, such as die cut accordions by Lothar Megendorfer. And the form of the toy aims to surface and challenge reductive readings of intersectionality that look at it mistakenly as a concept about additive or stable notions of identity. And instead we highlight the simultaneity and variety of experiences of both oppression and empowerment with everyday encounters. So in this toy, we invite participants to engage the history of this concept and explore both the pains and the joys of inhabiting the margins. And the ghost figures for intersectionality are the women who experience, exp um, express and work against compounded effects of systems of oppression in theory and practice, specifically the Kambahi River Collective founded by Barbara Smith. They founded a black feminist lesbian socialist organization um, active from 1974 to 1980. They argued that neither the civil rights movement nor the feminist movement responded to their needs and experiences. And their work has been carried forward by many, including the scholars and artists who wrote this bridge called My Back edited by Cherry Moraga and Gloria Anzaldúa. There are some ex experience frames examples, plus images of the Lothar Megendorfer historical form in the upper right. The fourth toy is circular conversations, and it focuses on feminist scholarship that emphasizes the repetitive pattern of struggle, uh, structures that maintain the status quo, and possibilities for breaking free or liberation. So inspiration comes from medieval volvels, and the toy aims to advance material engagements with feminist theories um, around complaint, liberatory performative practice and scholarship on the cyclic natures of both oppression and liberation. The ghost figure is Carolee Schneeman and her work Interior, Interior Scroll. This was a typed scroll, another form that draws on circularity, which she uh, in 1975 in a performance unfurled from her own vagina during a nude live art performance in New York. The text on the scroll, which she read aloud as she unrolled the paper, materialized her own experience of a circular conversation with misogynistic avant-garde male filmmakers who degraded and misunderstood her work as simplistic and uninteresting. And by the final unfurling of the scroll, she liberated herself from that circular conversation and revealed the depths of the male colleague's sexist misunderstanding of her work. So similarly, this toy invites participants to liberate themselves by inventing a way out of the oppressive circle. And there are some examples. Toy five is conflicts and coalitions accordions. And this is a kind of accordion book that when it, as it unfolds, it changes directions 180 degrees. And it takes as its starting point, feminist scholarship on incommensurability, agonism, and the value of um, opposition and conflict. So differences and conflicts are surfaced and shared. At the same time, possibilities for action are explored. And each participant is invited first to create their own single accordion, but then work with others to cut up and reconfigure <laughs> sections in new ways. And the ghost figure is Pauline Oliveros, the electronic musician and deep listening pioneer who passed away recently in 2016, whose primary instrument was the accordion. She was also the pioneer of the deep listening practice, uh, which opens listeners to a new connection between self, others, and the world through sound. Here's some examples. Toy Six is the fortune teller. It draws on the classic paper toy, fortune teller or the salt teller, but we change the scale of this toy to change the nature of interaction with the material form. So we scale the toy up so large that it can only be operated in collaboration with two or more people. It cannot be used alone. The collaborative nature of the oversized form is used to develop the content for the fortune flaps, which display co-authored or co-illustrated representations of speculative futures. And this toy is in conversation with work on feminism and futurism, feminist speculative design, and feminist theories of fiction and storytelling. And the ghost figure for the sixth toy comes in the form of the ancestors honored in Diana Alvarez's multimedia performance, Caro Valver, a Chicanx ritual opera for queer and trans artists of color. 
And in this art, in this opera, Alvarez foregrounds the multiplicity of love and connection, even between this world and others. And there you can see just for scale, like what the normal fortune teller size is on the right and the size of the fortune teller toy in our case on the left, which you cannot operate alone. The seventh toy is the curation and collection folio. And this has pockets for bringing the six toys, the first six toys together in assemblage. And here we're looking at framing and arrangement of structures that hold, and they're also produce knowledge and discussing those in relation to feminist theories of things like agential cuts, feminist scholarship on informatics, such as research on the history and power relations of the card catalog, and perspectives on feminist curation in the art world. The idea here isn't this isn't this isn't meant to be an end to the series, but an invitation to a new beginning, to trouble ideas of authorship and invite participants together to rearrange and combine toys collectively in new ways to do things like collectively develop a feminist killjoy survival kit. And the ghost figure for this toy is Edessa Hendelis. Now she's not literally a ghost, she's still with us, but her practice is ghostly. She's an innovative Canadian artist curator. And she has a practice of developing the curator in her installations as, as a figure whose presence is ghostly here and yet not. For example, in a 2007 show in Toronto, she had a single um, shoe of hers, a stiletto heel of hers and a tight spotlight labeled as the shoe of the curator. And so she's resisting the dominant mode of invisible curation and surfacing the ways in which curation is authorship and um, debunking myths of objectivity. And then the final toy is the living toy. And we're invited here to understand paper, which we've been working with through the first seven toys in its connection to living matter. So the tree, in the case of paper that's made from wood pulp, and a complex entanglement of industrial, ecological, and cultural processes that circulate, produce, and transform paper. Some of this scholarship draws on indigenous knowledge and acknowledges indigenous interrelations with plant life. Of course, papers in a relation with the world of plants and animals, including humans, has been fraught with issues of environmental destruction, due in part to the contamination of large quantities of water that are necessary in the paper production process, not to mention issues of extractive deforestation. So paper here is revealed as far from the blank sheet we might imagine when we think about the printer ream. But inviting us into mess, dirt, and transformation and growth through interrelation with the more than human, the eighth toy suggests the creation of a biodegradable plant pot made of paper to fill with dirt and plant with a seed. And the ghost figure is Anna Atkins, the English botanical researcher who was the first person to publish a book illustrated with photographic plates. Um, to, um, pub she published multiple volumes with cyanotype plates in the 1840s and 1850s on her research on algae. Her work bridges art, science, emerging tech, nature, design in very inventive ways. For example, she implemented strands of seaweed to create her own custom font for the covers of the books. So just as her work represents this creative blurring and bridging between paper, the vegetal, art, design, and science, so too the eighth toy invites the makers into these entangled connections. But I said this was a work in progress, and it is. And so next, Nassim and I are working on developing a more embodied expression as a capstone to the series, and that's in the form of a playground design. And again, like with the toys, Nassim and I will first experiment with our own designs in conversation with historical forms and theoretical work. But in the end, what we aim to produce is a prompt for others to create their own playgrounds. And finally, what's our ultimate goal with this project? We wanna to work towards a practice of live theorization as you just see described in this quote. One important note, while the toys are easy to make and engage, we don't see them as standalone pedagog pedagogical artifacts. So just as Josephine was highlighting in terms of the need for facilitation, with our toys, it's crucial for facilitators to create a brave space and a learning environment community in which both students and instructors are invited to bring their whole selves into relation with the material. Uh, and that's significant. And so the learning that we aim for, thanks, um, in this uh, project is really only possible when the hard work of that kind of facilitation has been done. Um, we also uh, are working with paper because it's such a flexible and humble material and always ready for reinvention, just as toys are always ready for reinvention. You can grow with toys and find them an object of fascination your whole life, but you can also outgrow toys and you can also outgrow theories. On the other hand, the knowledge gained in meaningful exchange 
in dialogue with others is less disposable and it has the potential for transformative effect. So here we see the toys as valuable, humble companions for the facilitation of meaningful dialogue between people enacting live theorization. Thank you.